Okay, if members are content to proceed. Um, can I uh, welcome members to the sixth meeting of the Audit Committee? Um, uh, any apologies, Chair? We haven't. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I remind members that they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest during, uh, during each committee meeting, uh, as previously indicated? Um, does any member have any interest to declare? No. Okay. And can I ask uh, members to note that the draft minutes from last week's meeting will be considered at the next committee meeting, uh, along with minutes from this meeting? Uh, we'll now move on to the next item of business. I can remind members uh, this uh, agenda item is being reported by hand, sir, and refer members to the papers in both the main meeting pack and the table pack, which you have received. A finalised budget for the Commission has been provided. Uh, fig figures have previously considered by this committee have been revised at pages 7 to 12 of the main pack. A copy of correspondence from the Department of Finance regarding the uh, budget plans for the NMPBs has been uh, provided for page, uh, page 20 of the main meeting pack. And finally, the preparation sheet is at pages 3 to 16 of the table pack. Can I welcome our witnesses today? You're very welcome, Leslie Hogg, Chief Executive of the Assembly, and Richard Stewart, Director of Corporate Services of the Assembly. Can I invite you both to give a short uh, opening statement? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chair, at the meeting on the 7th of October, the Committee considered an indicative budget for the Commission for 21-22. And at that meeting, I advised that the Commission would be undertaking a detailed assessment of its requirements for 21-22, and that I would then report on any significant changes to the Committee. So the briefing for today's meeting covers the changes that have been identified. Before looking at the actual figures, I would again remind the Committee that the budget for 21-22 is based on the assumption that the operating environment for, for next year will be more or less back to normal. And if that assumption changes, then obviously the budget will change as we go through the year. Probably the easiest way, Chair, is to turn to the figures in Annex A, and I'll work members through those. So the forecast income for next year has decreased by £109,000, and that's largely as a result of secondment arrangements that have changed since October. The next line then with any changes are in relation to constituency costs and there has been an overall net increase of £208,000 in members' constituency costs and that is made up of two elements, namely members' constituency staff costs and establishment expenses. So members' constituency staff costs have increased by £267,000 to reflect the inflationary uplift for members' support staff for 21-22. However, this has been partially offset by a decrease of £104,000 as long-run trends show that every member does not generally use all of the allowance for staff costs. The second element of that is in relation to establishment expenses and they have been increased by £45,000 and that's because the expenditure in the current year 2021 is likely to be less than anticipated, which means that there's a higher residual amount that can remain to be spent next year. The next key change then is in relation to other costs, members' other costs, and the forecast has been reduced by £43,000, and this is just to reflect more up-to-date information on the likelihood of members retiring on ill health grounds. Secretariat salaries have been increased by £146,000, mainly to reflect the progression of staff up the pay scales next year. And finally then, in this category, the, the last change is in relation to party allowance, and this relates to the financial assistance for political parties scheme. There has been an increase of £75,000, and this has been included as an estimate for any increase that might arise from AERC's consideration of payments to opposition parties, and also a review of the FAP scheme by the Commission. As neither of these reviews have commenced, the figure of £75,000 is simply an estimate at this stage, and therefore has a high degree of uncertainty. The final element of revenue expenditure is in relation to depreciation and impairment, and it's anticipated that the technical accounting changes for depreciation will fall by £200,000 from the previous estimate, 
and that really reflects our most up-to-date calculations. So the net increase in terms of resource stale is an increase of £296,000 from the figures initially indicated to the committee in October. And I would just like to highlight that in the table, the party alliance under the final budget says 721. There are a couple of drafting errors. That should actually read 800,000. And therefore, the total non-ring resourced or non-ring fenced resource stale should be 45,833,000 rather than the 45,559,000 ,000 on the table. The proposed capital expenditure then is set in the following table at Annex B, and again, I'll be happy to walk you through that. So overall, the capital forecast has increased by £299,000 to reflect updated figures for some of the previously reported projects and also to include some new projects, mainly in re relation to ICT and broadcasting infrastructure investment. So you can see the changes that are set out there. There's been a slight decrease in the replacement cost of the security management system by £40,000, an increase of 75000 for the replacement of the TV and the distribution system, and that really reflects our more up-to-date estimates. There has been an increase of 75000 for our remote access solution, and that's really to facilitate electronic working. There's a new line then in terms of broadcasting, and this is to do with investment in a production gallery for broadcasting, a central technical area, and the replacement of small minor items, and there's £104,000 included for that. The replacement of the email firewall, we think, will probably be £20,000 more, and that's up to 50000 There's a new line in now, provision of internet connections, and some of our Wi-Fi is nearing its end of useful life, and therefore we plan to re re replace that around the end of the mandate. So it's likely maybe half the cost might be occurred in next financial year, and then half the cost in the following financial year. And finally, then at the bottom, there's an inclusion of fifteen thousand pounds for portraits for former assembly office holders. So say overall, a net increase of two hundred and ninety-nine thousand pounds in capital. And again, Chair, I'm very happy, Richard or I, to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Uh, and again, you are both very welcome. We appreciate uh, your time this morning. Um, a, a lot has changed, I suppose, over the last number of, uh, particularly over the last year, when you consider the challenges on, uh, for these institutions, obviously, we're close to the public, and that'll have a direct impact on uh, any potential income through maybe the restaurant or any other services in the building. So. Uh, I'm going to touch on that briefly, and also uh, in relation to the changes to the assembly determination, a key factor in the increase and the need for extra allocated funds in order to meet those challenges. Um, there, many of us have um, spoke of this, uh, and uh, the need uh, that, that there was a critical need to address the uh, issue in relation to assembly staff or uh, member staff, I should say, sorry, who were uh, who the whose pay conditions were very, very poor, uh, and I'm glad that through the work of the Commission they've been addressed, so I, I can understand the clear links as to how uh, we've reached the situation where there is a need for uh, further allocation of monies. In terms of capital expenditure, uh, a number of things. Uh, I, I notice the new phone system is in and working very well, uh, and that's very much welcome. And I know that there's other elements of the building that we need to play catch-up on, namely the TV screens. <laughs> Um, that um, do need to be addressed, you know, even from a, never mind the practical issues in terms of how technology has advanced in the 30 years since those TVs have been developed, but even how they look in terms of this assembly, I would like to think that we are uh, well on the, on the races in terms of uh, addressing those, those, those issues. I'm just looking for an update in relation to where we are with that. Will it be this year or next year as when that's rolled out? Uh, disability access has been something that's been addressed on many occasions as well, uh, and um, the, uh, the ground floor is very well equipped now, and I know there has been changes made, automatic doors, and I know there's further discussions in relation to that as well. Again, I appreciate that will all add uh, pressure to uh, the finances of the building. Uh, but in terms of the assembly chamber itself, um, I would like an update as to where we are in terms of the capital works that are required there to make the chamber much more accessible for uh, disabled members. 
Um, I know there is some form of access at the present time, but we, I'm wondering what's been done to address that because I know there was discussions about it. Um, so there's a number of points in there. So the, 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 in terms of capital, um, the, the upgrade on the, on the TV system throughout the building, um, and what, what's the update in relation to that, and the other uh, in relation to the roof, I should say, and, and the building, which a lot of money was spent on a number of years ago. Um, what is the situation with that? Uh, who is liable for the cost of double it, doing the work again? Uh, and is there any redress in terms of chasing up the previous contractor, uh, given that that work, um, there's issues with the roof? So, okay. Okay. Um, well, first, in relation to your question about the TVs, yes, they are planned for replacement in the current financial year, and there's now a figure of £200,000 included, and that will replace both the TVs and the associated distribution system. Um, in relation to the roof, then, as we talked about the last time, there have been some um, evidence of water ingress, and there are three main issues to do with the, the roof. Initially, there was some water ingress identified sl sl or shortly after the roof was completed in 2015, and there were a few um, s a small areas of water ingress um, in the corridor on the third floor. Mm -hmm. That pro problem occurred again in June 2016. Um, what we believed was the cause at that time was repaired, and we thought that was the situation dealt with. However, there has been further ingress in that area. During then 2018, um, during the heat wave, there were some issues with the stainless steel guardrails that had been installed in the roof, and they had twisted and warped. And the contractor agreed to repair the handrails as necessary, and where appropriate, to make some minor adjustments to the guardrails against a reoccurrence of the problem. In June 2019, then we discovered that there had been some stone spalling had occurred in the roof parapet at the rear of the building, and the subsequent investigation points strongly to there being a direct link between the stone spalling and the handrail issues. And there's been some cracking observed at other locations, and that's been kept under review. So the investigation also found evidence of water at the handrail uprights, a problem that could have implications not only for the stone spalling, but also potentially allow water into the fabric of the building at other locations. And then following Storm Francis in August this year, water ingress was encountered in several areas of the third and fourth floors of the building. Two of those related to areas that were previously investigated and the remaining issues related to new problems that are believed to be outside the scope of the roof project and are being separately investigated. So where we are in these, there's been a number of discussions with the contractor and the design team, and at the minute we are continuing to work both with the de design team and the contractor to determine the cause of the problems, agree responsibility for them, and to identify a methodology to have those rectified um, to our satisfaction. So that's ongoing, Chair, at this stage. And the final area I think you mentioned was in relation to the accessibility works in the chamber. Um, as you say, some parts of the chamber are accessible and some are not, and that is quite a big project. So there'll be some work will have to be undertaken in relation to upgrading the broadcasting infrastructure, and we'll also have to consider there, at, you know, at a similar time, whether there will be further improvements to the accessibility works. Obviously, the the size of the chamber is quite small, and there's not an awful lot of scope um, to make significant changes to it but we'll obviously be giving that matter some consideration. Thank you uh, very much for that, it's very helpful. Just a number of points uh, in relation to uh, general accessibility to the, to the assembly chamber, uh, not, 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 not just in terms of disabled access. You know, COVID has restricted our access to that chamber uh, this year uh, in many ways uh, because, we're, because of social distancing. Uh, but I note that other legislators have uh, put in place uh, teleconferencing uh, into the actual chamber. So, for instance, um, if you had a question in the House of Commons to the Prime Minister or, or another minister, you can ask directly from your office as opposed to being in the chamber. I'm just conscious that at a time where uh, the pressure on uh, our services and on people generally in the community is, is so great uh, that it's very important that our members in this assembly, all 90, uh, are accommodated uh, as effectively and as efficiently as possible within that 
chamber. And I'm just wondering, nine months on, has there been any conversation as to how that could be accommodated? Because we could be looking at the best part of next year before the vaccine is rolled out in its entirety. Uh, and therefore, that means there'll be huge restrictions on our ability as legislators to perform in that assembly chamber. So is there anything similar to what we've seen in other um, legislators? Uh, the House of Commons is the best possible example, um, where uh, TV screens have been placed on walls and you can speak directly in the chamber, but you don't have to be in the chamber. Okay, well, in terms of whether that would be installed or not, I mean, the Commission would undertake any physical installation of TV screens where required, but ultimately that is a decision for the Committee on Procedures. So it would be up to the committee to decide if it wanted to make appropriate changes to standing orders. And if they were agreed by the Assembly, then the Commission would install the necessary equipment to facilitate that. And Claire, did we, to, we did. Did we get a response? No? Yeah, I'm just going to pull it up now, Chair. Thank you. Um, just, to, yeah, and in relation to uh, disabled access, um, uh, we, we can appreciate that the chamber is small in size, although we do have much more room given that we ha had uh, 18 uh, MLAs more than we have now uh, before the most recent changes at the start of this mandate. Um, and we would welcome uh, any progression on that uh, because it's important that we have a chamber that is accessible to all our members um, comfortably. Um, and I would very much like to see that. Got that, Clerk? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We received a response back from the Committee on Procedures on the 19th of November about hybrid proceedings. And um, the clerk of that committee has referred to uh, the amendment to standing orders that the Chief Executive has alluded to, and that further investment and infrastructure would be required and would be brought to the attention of the Assembly Commission. The committee was not minded to amend standing orders at that stage, but would consider doing so should the Assembly agree to introduce hybrid proceedings. However, given the number of MLAs, including executive ministers, who have recently either had to self-isolate or indeed test a positive for COVID-19, the committee agreed that it would reconsider amending standing orders to allow for hybrid proceedings. The chairperson has therefore written to the speaker on this issue and commenced informal discussions with Assembly officials regarding the introduction of hybrid proceedings and the potential amendment to relevant standing orders. Okay, so you. they're taking it forward. Thank you, Eric, that's positive as well. Uh, just before I allow our members in, um, I, I just want to discuss the RIF. Um, 2000, so the work, the issues noticed on the third and fourth floor this year uh, are new problems, I think you've said, Leslie, but see any prior to that? Was that issues that were identified that were to be resolved by the contractor in 2015? Yes, well, the recent issues, half of them, so two of the recent issues were from the original um, water ingress, and then there were two further issues identified in August of this year. So, as I said earlier, the issues had initially been identified in 2015 and 2016. They were investigated, and the contractor um, made a resolution that we thought would resolve the issue, but then they appeared again um, in August of this year. And you'll probably understand, Chair, that water ingress can be extremely hard mm. to detect, and therefore it's not always very straightforward to identify the actual source of the leak from where it appears in the building. So we are continuing to work our way through that. Okay. Um, I'm happy for uh, members to come in now. Um, we'll start with uh, Joanne Bunting. Joanne. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Richard, for your presentation. Uh, just to follow up on the roof issue, so in those terms, in circumstances where this half of this damage is found to relate to previous work undertaken, we're now going to be five, six years down the line, it should work have to be, well, work is going to have to be conducted to try and find it and source it and fix it. So who's liable at this point? Well, obviously, if it was an issue from the original installation, we would consider the contractor to be liable. So they say that's what we're working through, the exact nature of the issues, what the cause of those issues are, and then ultimately where liability rests with those. And is there a time limit on that? Not really. I mean, we're continuing to work through those. Again, you probably understand that when there are issues like this, they can be difficult to uh, resolve 
um, for a number of issues in terms of identifying the source of the leak, putting in place a satisfactory resolution and then sorting out liability. So say we're continuing to work our way through those, but obviously if there are issues relating to the original um, RIF project, then we would expect those to be resolved as part of that contract. Right, so you, you haven't, have you factored anything into your budget with regard to that there may be additional things on top of that that would need to be accounted for and paid for? No? No, we haven't, because at this stage we're continuing to um, consider where liability rests and whether that less rests with the contractor or not. Okay, and in circumstances, it, if within the course of the financial year it's found that it doesn't rest within the contractor, what then? I, I think that's probably unlikely to be resolved um, within the financial year and for us then to incur any expenditure if it was determined that liability did not rest with the contractor. That would probably be a subsequent year. If I can take you to um, your report on the budget, I'm not sure if it's your report or ours actually, but the report that we have with regard to financial assistance for political parties um, indicates an increase of 76,000 rather than 75. Which, what's to, to 800,000? Which, which figure is it? It's really the increase of 75,000 pounds, and that's just a very recent adjustment. So yes. Um, apologies for that typo. No, that, that's okay. I, and just so that we can understand, um, that's quite a significant increase. What are the proposed changes to the FAP scheme? Well, that's what I'm explaining in the, the paper. So there are likely to be changes that come out of AERC's review of opposition rights and any um, alliances associated with that. And also the current FAP scheme has been in existence from 2016. So the Commission is planning to undertake a review of FAP. As I've said in the briefing paper, that is yet to commence, and therefore it's very difficult to put any estimate on what figures may or may not be required as the outcome of both the AERC review and the Commission's review of the FAP scheme. So the 75,000 is purely an estimate at this stage. But you do have some cognizance as to what's on the table in that regard? No, the Commission hasn't commenced its review. What about ARC? An ARC, it is commissioning an independent review, and that hasn't started yet either. So therefore, I say we, we really can't estimate. You know, it's very difficult to put any sort of figure as to what may be the outcome of both of those reviews. So, what was the rationale for plumping for a seventy-five thousand figure? Well, that was in at around ten percent, which we thought may be a reasonable 10%. figure. Okay. Can I take you to then the issue about, uh, in paragraph 11 of the report that we have, based on analysis of historical expenditure patterns for member support staff costs, it seems unlikely that all members will utilise the full staffing costs provision in the determination, and that's the, the resulting figure then is £104,000. Um, that's, that's not a small amount of money, Leslie, but I, I presume that it was borne in mind that previously members actually could not maximise, a number of members were not in a position to maximise. Because if you came in in 2016 and were allowed two full-time equivalents who started at the bottom of the grade and their increment was a set fee annually, it was impossible to reach a figure of £50,000. So are we sure, when you've counted in, that you're putting back this 104000 essentially, that it's not because people did not avail of the money, but that they could not, whereas now they might be able to, and it's likely that they will. I mean, have, has, has that been taken into account and calculated? Well, again, we've tried to, you know, make our best estimate in this. Um, we've also looked at the, the current year's expenditure, and again, it doesn't look at this stage as if all members will utilise their full allowance. Now, until obviously we get a few years under the new rules, then we'll get a better estimate, but I suppose what we were trying to do is reflect what we thought were the practical outworkings and inevitably some members tend not to use all of their, their allowance, so it's just over about £1,000 per member, roughly, that we're saying might not on average be spent. It's very useful for members who aren't busy enough to need all their staff allocation. Um, right, just I suppose then a couple of last things that I have put to all the others who have been in with regard to their budgets. The Department of Finance has indicated 
fitted is asking the departments to live within their baseline. If that were the case, and, and obviously there's a difficulty for us because how can we ask people to some extent, uh, how can we ask the departments to do that when they're providing frontline services and not ask the other groups that we're responsible for to do likewise? So that would need to be justified. In circumstances where you were asked to live within your baseline budget, how will you prioritise your work? What would be prioritised? And, and I appreciate this is stuff in there that's inescapable to you now because of the determination. But were you asked to, to live within your revised baseline taking account of the determination, how would you prioritise your work? And what would be cut? Well, obviously, yes. Chair, um, we would need to sit down and go through that process with the Commission, so I wouldn't be able to give you an indication at this stage as to exactly what would be cut or what would not be cut, but obviously the Commission would need to go through a prioritisation exercise and decide where savings needed to be achieved and therefore what would be stopped. OK, thank you. Uh, if I could just supplement a few points. I, I think Joanne hits on a chord that the member feels is strongly about the issues our staff faced, uh, uh, as I do, and, and there was huge issues that were created largely by the uh, previous panel uh, that uh, uh, concluded the determination. Sta staff were staff conditions uh, were not good; they were very bad, in fact, uh, and there was all sorts of issues uh, that needed to be addressed. Um, so, I can understand the, the reasoning for. <coughs> the extra cost in that, uh, and I don't believe it's the fault of the Assembly. I think this is a, a wrong that has been put right in that regard, and I know the member would agree with me in, in terms of staffing. Um, I'm just wondering, previous, and I realise this is before your time, I'm conscious, but I'm, maybe Richard may know, but previous to the 2016 or 2015 determination, when was it? 2017 determination? 2016, 2016 determination. Previous to the 2016 determination, was, the, was there an increase in cost to resource that determination, or was there a decrease on what was there previous? I'm just, I'm just wondering you know, what way that went, if, if you understand me. Yeah, I think probably the best way to look at that, Chair, would be to look at the report that the yeah. panel produced. They produced a determination and they produced a report. Right. And they set out the, the ups and the downs as a result of all the factors in the determination. Um, one of the big ups in that was an increase in members' salary, uh, which obviously the Commission has no responsibility for yeah. at all. Um, but yeah, there were a series of, of changes, some increased costs and some decreased costs, but that was set out um, by the panel in, in the report. It's a very, fairly comprehensive report that, that accompanied the determination in 2016. Okay. Yeah, I can understand that. Okay. Um, Emma, Rogan. Thanks, Chair. I just have a few um, questions. Has there been a significant um, reduction in revenue due to COVID on the, in terms of people being able to visit the building and, and that type of thing? There has been a little bit. I mean, our main other revenue streams would be from um, events that take place in the building, and obviously then from the likes of the dining. You know, the dining room being open to the public, etc. Um, maybe again, small income reduction from the gift shop, etc. In terms of sales that have been made to visitors. So yes, there has been a small increase from those elements. Okay, and. Um with regards to ministers um, that that make a contribution um, to the to the commission, is, is there any sort of figures on that to where that sort of comes around? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm unclear. Um, it's ministerial salaries yeah, coming back in. The ministerial salaries. So that's really a technical um, adjusting adjustment with the Department of Finance. Previously, there was no money flowed, and they were really just a book a book charge. Right. Um, to departments, whereas now that is a physical recharge and therefore the money will come in, but there, that's a net increase of zero, if you know what I mean. Okay. So the money, so we incur the cost and then the money comes in to offset against that. One's offset against the other? Yes. Right, okay. And our budget was amended, you know, to reflect that. Okay. 
That's, that's, I have no other questions, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jim Allister. Yeah, last week in the Senate questions to the Commission, we were told that there was going to be appointed two additional staff members to deal with the Youth Assembly in addition to two already appointed. That suggests to me there's quite a bit of headroom if at the drop of a hat you can make such appointments. Well, that was already allowed in our budget and the two staff that are the two education officers that are working there really are working between themselves because initially we had identified one member of staff and actually there was an expression of interest from two members of staff for that role and therefore they do that job between them and we had a, we had budgeted for the two additional members of staff in our budget for this year was the youth assembly mentioned in last year's budget Yes, it was. It was in the um, there was an allowance made for the the youth assembly in this current year's budget, 2021. Of course, the assembly commission is in the rather luxurious position that no matter what it spends, its bills have to be met. Not right. Well, I don't think it's a luxurious position, and that would be. Um, how all of the other legislators generally would work in yes, terms of... Yes, but the Assembly Commission is in the unique position within these institutions that if it needs money, the Department of Finance has to produce it. But I think this is to reflect the constitutional... No, no, I'm not asking you to explain it. I'm asking you to agree that, that is that correct? Well, the Assembly Commission sets out its requirements. Yes. And obviously the process is that they're first scrutinised by the Assembly Commission... Yes then yourselves as the audit committee yes. and then a report is made to the assembly and there's a discussion and debate about the assembly's budget. Cut to the chase. If the assembly commission needs money, the Department of Finance legally has to provide it. Well, we have a, a memorandum of understanding yes. at this stage and yes. that would be the, the current circumstances and yes. previously was historically generally the position um, or certainly a considerable number of years. Yes. So it makes this whole budgetary exercise a bit academic, does it not? If you are in that luxurious position, that whatever you need, you have to get. I don't think it makes it academic at all. It's obviously a line, a scrutiny process. It's a cover, it puts a face on it. I don't think it puts a face. I mean, we're obviously going through a governance process, and as say, officials will draft a budget that's scrutinised first by the members of the Assembly Commission then the audit committee and then the assembly itself. But let's be clear, if during the course of the upcoming year, for some unforeseen reason, you are five million pounds short, the memorandum of understanding guarantees you that five million pounds. Isn't that right? Well, it has to go through the process. Yes, but at the end of that process, the end is known from the beginning. Isn't that right? Why, why quibble with that? That's the reality, isn't it? Well, I'm, I'm just explaining there is due process that goes on oh, in yeah. the background. Yes, I mean, I the, the Commission doesn't you know, just simply pluck a figure from the air. It goes through quite a detailed scrutiny yes. process itself. But it has got that comfort blanket of knowing that whatever it needs, it ultimately gets. Well, I think that's to reflect the constitutional independence of the Assembly from the Executive. So, for example, to link that to the issue of the roof, if it were to turn out, for example, that the Assembly Commission approved a faulty design in relation to the railings, putting them into the parapet, causing a, a water track, which is now leaking, and you had no case against the contractor, the Assembly Commission would have to fix it and draw the money from the Department of Finance. Isn't that right? Well, obviously, as I've said at this stage, we're pursuing with the contractor the defects, and we would hope to achieve a resolution through that mechanism. Is there an arbitration clause in the contract? With... Pardon? Is there an arbitration clause in the contract? I'm not sure I couldn't answer that, but be very happy to come back to you. When was the contract? Well, the RIF project works were completed in 2015. I'm not sure when the original contract was let. I don't know if you know, Richard. 
yeah, it was predated that by two years. I think it was 14 was the act, or sorry, 13 but, but was the date it was left. The completion is 15. Do we know when in 15? Uh, summer comes to mind. I'll, I'll get the exact So in the summer of 21, the legal limitation period for suing for breach of contract will expire in six months' time. Which is why we're, we're actively engaged with the... Uh, yes, but you told us that three months ago. We don't seem to be making much progress. Like the clock is running down. Well, I think, as I explained earlier, you know these are not easy issues to resolve. They'll not um, be resolved to come June with. or July if the limitation period's up. Well, I mean, we are actively working to seek a resolution and you know establish where liability rests. Why? Why is there a doubt about liability? Well, obviously, with any construction project, it's identifying is the source of the issue related to the original contract or is it a separate issue? And I, I highlighted that of some of the recent um, examples of water ingress two seem to be associated with the original water ingress and two seem to be new yeah. issues and therefore wouldn't be associated with the, the RIF project. But if, for example, they're in consequence of the railings and the uprights being put into the parapet, causing cracks, causing water to flow in, which is the uh, allowing the, the ingress. That flows from the work done on the roof. Now, surely the only circumstances in which the contractor would not be liable for that was if the Assembly Commission, in its wisdom, approved that design of drilling into the parapet. Did the Assembly Commission approve that design? Well, as I've said, I mean, these are all very detailed issues and we're yes, working... but I asked you that three months ago. It's not a new question. It's not a new question, but, I mean, there was a... The question I think we're entitled to an answer to. Did Our the Assembly Commission approve the design, which is now proved faulty? So the guardrail system was specified by the originally specified by the design team as a proprietary system. However, the final solution was a hybrid system, and one strand of the ongoing investigation is to review the process that led to that change being approved. So, to say we're, we're working our way through these detailed issues. Is someone trying to conceal the fact that maybe the Commission did approve that which has gone wrong? Absolutely not. Well, I hope not. But I think when you ask the same question three months apart and still don't get an answer, it's not very satisfactory. Well, I think whenever you raised those issues, that was back in October. Well, two uh, months. So really, then. only two months at this stage. Two months, right. And obviously, as I say, these are difficult issues to resolve and to establish where liability rests. So we've got to work through due process, well, as you probably understand. I just respectfully remind you again, the clock is ticking. Six-year liability period for breach of contract will run out in the incoming year. And we have asked this question before, and I would like an answer to it. Well, obviously, these are matters for the Assembly Commission and, as I say, the Commission is continuing to, to progress those. Can I make a proposal that we write to the Commission seek an, an urgent update in relation to these matters? Um, I think Mr Alistair has a very good point, uh, and we are talking about huge sums of public money. W what was the total cost of that contract in 2015? Uh, it was just over £5 million. It's a huge amount of money. It's, it's well, is there any estimate of what the repairs will cost? Not at this stage. Thank you, Chair. So, can we agree to, if members are agreed, um, write to the Commission and seek an urgent update in relation to uh, these matters? Mm. Detail may be a question or two just after the sessions, I don't think. Um,
I think that's all for today. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations and for taking our questions. Uh, and just uh, before you leave it, I'd like to put firmly on record my sincerest appreciation to the staff of the Assembly, who have been more than accommodated and very, very kind and generous with the time and, uh, and assisting us all in our duties. Uh, and to um, wish you well over Christmas and, and your families as well. And thank you very much. Thank you, sure. Stuart. That will be very much appreciated by the staff. It has been a, a long and difficult yeah, year. Has, has thank you. Thank you. If um, members are agreed, we'll move into the closed session for the next item of business. It's the NAO, NIPSO, and NAA consideration. Any position? All agreed? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.